I came to GMI in 1991. I was a non-believer. I was led by my manager for the company that I was working for. It was 1991. It was January, and I came to this church, and after a few weeks, I accepted Christ as a Savior, and I became Christian, and then I decided to invite my mother and my two younger sisters who were living in Colorado, in Denver area. So in about August or September, and I went to Denver to bring my mother and bring all the stuff to California. And uh, in 1991, I don't know if you remember, some of you were not even born in 1991, I realize. Um, California was going through a tough economic time because... Back then, there were a lot of defense industry companies, a lot of like Hughes and uh, Radians, uh, some other companies like that, major money-earning companies. But because of high rate for their properties, they decided to move to Middle East or Middle West to like a Texas and different states. So these companies were moving out of California uh, so by then, many people were moving out of, away from California to different states. And that was a condition. But me, I was also an electrical engineer and looking for defense industry related companies. And I couldn't find one, even though I submitted about 108 different resumes and no company contacted me for interview. And I ended up I thought I was going to find this Korean company, but it was an engineering company, small company, and I thought it would be temporary, but ended up working for that company for nine and a half years. Because I found this manager who was a devout Christian, and he went to the same school, University of Colorado at Boulder. He studied aerospace, and I studied electrical engineering. But anyways, from... Through him, I came to this church, I accepted Christ as a Savior, and my life totally turned upside down. And I became frantic, Christian, crazy about Jesus Christ, quit smoking, quit drinking, quit womanizing, whatever you may say. Oops, my wife is here. <laughs> Forgive me. Instant forgiveness, honey. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to Denver and packed everything, and I was driving this yellow U-Haul truck from Colorado to California. On the way, I would see all these yellow U-Haul trucks going opposite ways. I was the only one going to California. All these people, like two minutes after, five minutes after, I would see U-Haul trucks going away from California, then I got frightened. What am I doing? Am I crazy? Am I making a mistake? I was scared. I'm making wrong decision. But then I reminded myself why I am moving with my entire family to California. Because I met God in California. Because I received Jesus as my personal Savior, and God will have a certain plan and blessings in California. And that's why I'm going. So everybody is moving away from California. That's okay. As long as God is with me, as long as God has some plan in California, it will be okay. And as I look back now, that was 23 years ago, I don't regret because... I met God. God blessed me. God trained me here, here and there. God was paving my ways. So I never regret. When we live Christian life, when we walk with Jesus Christ, sometimes we need to make a decisions where we need to overcome some fears. We need to make a decision that is so risk-taking. Sometimes we might think, I may be making wrong decisions or making mistakes. However, that decision against our own fear can be true 
decision that will pave our life. In the end, we enjoy tremendous blessings of the Lord. Praise God. Amen. So faith is risk taking. Faith requires to take a risk. It's an adventurous journey as we try to walk by faith and not by sight. Because sometimes when Jesus Christ calls us or God calls us to certain places, we need to leave our comfort zone and go into the place where there are dangers and risk rating. And at least to human perspectives, it will take us a gut to go forward. And it's a risk taking. But that is, that is okay. Why? Because our God is a loving God, just like we praised and we repeated after this lyric. God's love, enduring love, no matter what happens through the calm and through the storm, He will raise us up again. Even though from our mistakes, even though from our foolish choices we make, but still, He's a merciful God and He's a gracious God and He has a plan for us to bless us and He will lead us to the way ultimately according to His plan. Praise God. Praise God. If you want to give a clap offering unto God, let's do so. Today's a strange Sunday because when I was preaching at KM, people were clapping hands too. <laughs> Today's passage is a very familiar story. Jesus Christ performed the miracles with the five loaves and two fish, and he fed 5,000 people. And right after this miracle, he will send his 12 disciples, put them in the ship, and ask them to go to the other side. And the other side, the town was called Gennesaret. The miracle where he performed was a Bethesda. As you know, Sea of Galilee is not a large lake. The width, the maximum width, is about seven miles long. But if you look at the old map, map during the Jesus time, Gennesaret and Bethesda, it's not that wide. It's not that long. Maybe it's about less than three miles long. But we know the miracle happened during dinner time, obviously. It was in the evening. And he sent them away in the evening, right after dinner. Then they are toiling, they are roaring the ship. But because the wind was contrary, because the storm and the waves roaring against them in the middle of the night. In fact, the Bible says it was a fourth watch. Jewish people divided 12 hours, evening time and morning time, into three different times. First watch, second watch, and third watch from 6 p.m. in the evening until next morning, 6 a.m. But they divided it into three watches. But when they were conquered by Roman empires, Roman government used the four watches. So divided by 12 by 3. So when it says a fourth watch, it means it's between 3 a.m., 6 a.m. So leaving the Bethesda at 6 p.m., around 6 p.m. or 7 p.m., now until there are 3 a.m. or 4 a.m., they are still in the middle of the lake, not able to reach their destination. That was something happening. So let's read on our passage, and we can talk about the story further on. Let's look at book of Matthew chapter 14. Let's look at Matthew chapter 14 from verse 24 through 33. Book of Matthew chapter 14, 24, verse 24 through 33. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with the waves, for the wind was contrary. Oh, I think we can do better than that. Let's do it again, 24. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with the waves, for the wind was contrary.
Wow, you sound good. You speak better English than I. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Amen. Amen. So on the fourth watch, in the middle of night, almost becoming early morning, Jesus is walking on the water. He spent all night long praying on the top of the hill, a mountain, and he came down because he saw these disciples were having a hard time. So he's walking on the water, going, wind blowing against him, he's able to walk on the water, even though there are boisterous waves. Sorry about King James Version, but you know what that means. But anyways, because it was so dark, disciples were afraid. They were afraid anyways because of storm. Now this ghost, the spirit, is walking towards them. Wow! <laughs> Sorry. Wow! is a Korean style. Um, American style goes, oops. <laughs> Ghost is approaching to us. <laughs> they got so scared. <laughs> then Jesus says, Be not afraid, it is I. <laughs> then Peter, you know, I'm not just Peter, our older brother Peter, always outstanding, always proactive, always aggressive. Lord, if it is you, bid me to come nearer to you. Ask me to come. And Jesus said, Come. Then he goes, he steps out of the boat, wind, the strong winds and waves, and all these crazy things going on, and he goes, Yes. Bah, 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 bah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I cannot walk on the air. I'm walking on my faith. <laughs> He's, he goes a few steps. We don't know how many steps he walked. But he's looking at the wind, looking at the waves and look sad circumstances and he got frightened and he's a sinking, he's a drowning. And Jesus goes, oh thou of little faith. And he picks him up together with a Peter. Jesus walks toward the ship. And then as soon as they got into the ship, the wind ceased. And they were able to immediately go to Gennesaret. And we further read the Bible, then there was miracles happening, healings and deliverance and all these things happening. From this story that we want to learn certain principles in faith. What's happening here? What's happening? These disciples were trying to go to the destination where Jesus said to go. God called us. He has a plan. We have a vision, God-given vision, and we want to reach to that destination. And we are roaring, we are going and going. But wind is on the contrary. The wind is blowing against us, and fear and doubt and worries occupy our hearts and our lives. We are going nowhere. We are going nowhere. Our lives can be like that. For some years, my life was like that. Every year, at the end of the year, we celebrate. But in New Year, people are excited, we're having new hope. But for me, I was very discouraged, still being single. We don't, I didn't know where my wife will be. I'm getting older and older and older, 37 and 38 and 39. This year will be the same year as last year. I felt like I was going into circles, same year, but going nowhere. It was just like circle around and around and around, not able to go forward. 
Just like 12 disciples in the ship, they are rowing, they are experts for the Sea of Galilee. They are fishermen. They knew the wind, they knew the sea, they knew how to row the boat, but they were not able to go further. Nothing is happening. Then Jesus comes. Jesus comes. And they are afraid. And Peter, strengthened by his faith, asked Jesus to call him out of that boat. And Jesus says, come, come. Maybe the reason why our life it seems to be circling around, going nowhere, nothing to be improved. There's no development. There's no increase of our faith. There's no blessing. Same years, exact doing same thing. Yes, I come to Sunday worship, but nothing seems to be happening. Maybe Jesus is requiring us to step out of that boat. It's going nowhere. You know why it's not going nowhere? Because you are not relying upon me. You are now walking in faith. You are trying to do it by your own knowledge, by your own experience. You think you know how to manage your life, but it's going nowhere. But I'm calling you out of that comfort zone. So faith is risk-taking. First, we need to come out of our comfort zone. That comfort zone that each year repeating ourselves over and over and over again, nothing seems to be happening or improving. It's the same thing all over again. We are getting bored. Maybe our God is beating us. Come out of it. Come out of your comfort zone. You, that's not even peace. That's a false peace. Because you are so content where you are. And you are so afraid and frightened that you don't know how to step out. But Peter was a different. And he asked Jesus, give me to come and I will go out. Let's compare these two different environments. You are in the ship. Wind is blowing against you. You see wave. And the other circumstance is Jesus is walking on the sea. Which environment would you prefer? Which environment is safer? Of course, ship has a floor at least. And that's why 12 of them could not come out because they think because of that floor of the ship that prevent them to, of sinking. Is that right? But in reality, in spiritual reality, the more we are nearer to Jesus, that's the safest place. Amen? It's not because the floor can protect our feet. It's because even though it's in the water against the natural law, against the gravity that I know I will sink and die and be drowned. But if it is where Jesus is and I will go and approach him, that's the safest place. Not the sheep that goes nowhere. Our life is like that. Because we are so afraid. We look at the environment. We think because I have this job, because I'm working for this company, and because I get this paycheck, and that's a safe place. But God may call you out. Begin new business. I want to make you a billionaire for the sake of world mission. No, Lord. I need to have this green check twice a month so that I can pay the rent, so I, that I can have a pizza on the dining table. No, Lord. No, Lord. But it, come. Come with me. Yes, I am standing on the ocean, stormy ocean, but you come with me and I will take you and make you a businessman, Christian businessman. You will have a tremendous testimonies to the people and to the world. Come, come. The wind, storm, they are vain. When God called me into ministry, Within a year after I became Christian, he called me into ministry. For three years, I rebelled against God. I can't do it. You call me to be servant of God. Everybody is a servant of God. I can be businessman, make a lot of money, and funnel into world mission. That's a servant of God. And I was uh, making all kinds of excuses, and I didn't go to seminary. But after three years or better, I finally decided to go, but there was an area still I was lingering onto, not able to 
by faith, I stepped out. That was, I was still working for company full time because I was the primary breadwinner and I had a widowed mother and my youngest sister was living together. If I quit job, then we will be having a hard time paying the rent and bring the food on the table. So I couldn't step out. So I was taking part-time at Talbot Seminary while working full-time while being cell leader at GMI. You know what that means? No time for study. So for about three and four years, I would take a few classes, and in the middle of the semester, I would drop them all. Why? Because I couldn't have a time for study. Even though I was not dating, I didn't have any time to study. So I would co continually drop classes and get some classes in really bad grades. You don't want to know my GPAs. <laughs> because someone might call Dick and Bob meeting again. <laughs> so I had to step out. I had to step out. Working for that company for nine and a half years, I need to step up in faith. I don't know where money will come for living, and I don't know where the money will come for tuition. I had no idea. Nothing was visible, but I made a decision to quit the company and stepped out. Stepped out just like a Peter. I'm going to sink. Our entire family will be drowned, but amazing things happened. As soon as I stepped out and quit the company, Chama, Dr. John Kim, they didn't have a staff for overseeing the missions department. And they called me to work there part-time. And I was free to, to full-time, get a full-time courses at Talbot and things like that. They were all flexible, and they were going to give me $1,000. That's not much, but at least it will help a living. My youngest sister uh, making earning as well. That was one, but just a couple of weeks later, I don't know when I can register for next semester for tuition. Back then, JAMA, working together with the different mission agencies, we were taking 140 people from America to go to Kazakhstan because there was a large conference and we'll have a spiritual breakthrough in Central Asia. And I was a team leader for that. And then, among the team members, different church members joined together, and there were elders, the couple. They heard about my situation. One day, he called me on the phone and said, Shine, I heard that you quit your full-time job and you decided to go to seminary full-time. Us, we have decided to support you financially for entire tuition and with a fee for your textbooks until you graduate. No string attached. Praise God. So I was able to graduate Talbot by personal private scholarship. And until today, he kept his promise. He's an elder from different church. No string attached. Whatever I do, he doesn't mind. He doesn't care. He probably spent about thirty to $40,000 on me to help me to graduate seminary. I stepped out in faith. I had to sink, but I didn't sink. I flew. Sometimes when we make a decision in faith, we are at the edge of cliff. We are at the edge of cliff. I know for sure with my perception, with my knowledge, with my logic, if I step out, I know I'm going to fall and break my neck and die. I know it. But in faith, if there's a, just a little glimpse that Jesus is calling and God says something. Because at night, that night, 12 disciples looking Jesus, it was not clear. It was a blurry. Why? Because they were mistaken that that was a ghost. Sometimes we are so indecisive because we want to make sure 100% it's from the Lord. No. Oftentimes it doesn't come that way. Just like the 12 disciples, unclear. It's, is it ghost or Jesus Christ? Is it ghost or Jesus Christ? Is it me or the uncle? Uncle means Satan. Or, or 
Holy Spirit, we are not clear. But sometimes we are so indecisive because we want to have 100% assurance. No, if we want to have 100% assurance, why does God require us faith? Faith is no longer needed. If everything is clear, everything is real and 100% assured, why do we need a faith? Everyone can do it. But for Peter, it was unclear, unseen. Unvisible. But still, there was a claim that Jesus calling him up. And by faith, he stepped up. And we need to do that oftentimes. We need to do that oftentimes. That we need to step out. And I know we are standing at the edge of the cliff. I know for certain, with my own perception, if I step one more out, I'm going to fall. And break my neck and die. But oftentimes, I feel like that, standing at the edge. I'm making really rash choice and foolish decision by stepping out, giving finance chunk of it without knowing what's going to happen next or able to pay the rent. I'm staying, stepping out. I know I'm in my neck. But you know what? Oftentimes, I find myself blind, blind. I wish I can show you an illustration because if I step up, <laughs> I, don't, uh, I should have flown so that. Our comfort zone is not comfort unless Jesus Christ is in it. Our safest zone is not safe if God did not call us to be there. Our safest place, comfortest place, is where Jesus has called us to be. That's most the comfort, that's the safest place we want to be. And that place will create miracles and blessings and power that God has designed us to enjoy. Praise God. So faith requires risk-taking. Faith is a risk-taking where we need to come out of comfort. Zone. So we want to exercise as a ministry. All of you, please stand up. Go to a person you don't know. It takes a tiny bit of faith, right? Fear of rejection. Oh, let's go. And search out any person you don't know the name and go introduce yourself and ask that person's name. Go. Move. Mingle, please. Don't get comforted. Don't go to people you already know. Go to the people you don't know. Okay, service is not over. <laughs> Return back. Wow, this is a wonderful. I think we should prepare a donut right in front of this. Examine your life. Are you going around the circle? You don't think your life is not going forward? Maybe God is requiring you to step out in faith in your comfort zone. Do it. You're not going to break your neck. You'll find yourself flying. Second item, faith is a risk-taking where we overcome fear of people. We are so enslaved by the fear of man. Sometimes we don't even recognize it. Imagine you are Peter. You need to come out of sheep. Eleven disciples, what would they think? Oh, that Peter again. Oh, man, he's so obnoxious. He always wants to elevate himself. 
by faith he can walk on the water, all these accusation, criticism, blaming, all these. We in our mind, we in our hands, constantly that we think about other people's opinions, think about other people's criticism, and, and so forth. And those bind us where we are, and we cannot move forward. There are many stories in the Bible, too. Let's talk about blind man. Jesus was walking towards Jerusalem on the way of Jericho. There was a blind man, the male. He was crying out, son of David. He heard about Jesus performing miracles and healing. Jesus, have a mercy upon me. Have a mercy upon me. He's crying out. But multitude surrounding him said, what did he say? Contextualizing what he said in today's term. Shut up. Shut up! Shut up! Quiet! Shut up! Our Messiah, Master, is walking by. Why are you making such a noise? The more, however, he cried out and raised his voice, Son of David, have a muscle for me. Let's remember, people are not our saviors. People cannot save you. People cannot help you. People whom we need to love and serve not to rely upon, not to mind their opinions or their criticism because that's not going to help you. Our Savior is the Lord Jesus Christ. Our helper is Messiah. Our Redeemer is Almighty God, whom we need to rely upon, whom we need to be approved by, not by man. Don't mind about people blaming you, accusing you, criticizing you because you are making choices by faith. No. Zacchaeus, is that Zacchaeus? Climb up sycamore tree. He's middle-aged man. In their culture, it's a shameful behavior because, you know, they didn't have a trousers. Their clothes was like a skirt. And this man is climbing up sycamore tree. Then people be able to see. Oh. <laughs> Back then, I don't think they had an underwear. He didn't care. Why? Because if I am recognized by Jesus Christ, I want to be recognized by Jesus Christ. I want to meet the Lord and Savior, and I want to know what He desires on me. That matters. I don't care what other people say. You know how I became your EM, so-called lead pastor? Some years ago, I went to Talbot, and they gave me this test called the Michigan test. And this Michigan test is given to all the foreigners that English is not their mother tongue. And I had to take it. And I had lived in America for 13 years back then. And after I had taken that exam, you know what? They advised me. They asked me to take ESL 107. ESL 107 is those people, exchange students who come to America and they don't know how to speak English well, that's the class you need to go. I had lived in America for 13 years. I had to go to Korean company. I had to go to Korean family. I had to go to Grace Korean church. <laughs> Everywhere I go, so many Koreans. I had to speak Korean only. Maybe at company, a little bit, you know, dealing with the customers and other companies, I used English. Other than that, my English went down to the... Toilet. I was so ashamed. I was so frustrated. And I was so furious at me. Why? What have I done? My life, a loser. Lived in America for 13 years. I didn't have to take a Michigan test when I was in college. Now, as I enter into graduate school, they ask me to take 107. 107. I hate that number. And I couldn't. <laughs> I couldn't sleep that night. I couldn't sleep that night. I was so angry at myself. Lord, then in the early in the morning, as I usually go to early morning prayer, and I made a decision. Ask God, Lord, you be my tutor. You be my English tutor. Because the Holy Spirit can touch my tongue and be able to speak in tongue, then you can touch my tongue and be able to speak English for only. So in the morning, I will pray five things. First, perfect my accent. 
perfect my pronunciation, perfect my grammar, broaden my vocabulary, help me to freely preach the gospel in English. Every day I would go, but that first morning, all I could say was, God, I thank you. Then I didn't know how to express. I'm speaking in tongue, I'm praying in tongue in my mind, I, with my mind I want to pray to God, but I couldn't express myself because I didn't know how to speak. But I did not give up. Next day, next day, month after month, that I was so tempted to give up. Why? Because I was so frustrated. I couldn't express. I was able to freely pray in Korean, but now I can't because I bounded in myself to only pray in English. And along the way, something happened. Evangelism explosion. It's an evangelistic training program. And I did it in Korean for 10 years back then. Then on that particular year, church formed some English group, English teams. If you know that program, there's one trainer and there are a couple of trainees. And you go out and meet prospects and you share the gospel. And it takes sometimes 30 to 40 minutes of content. And I decided to do it. I was so scared. What would other people would think? I have a southern accent. I'm, I'm from southern part of Korea, and they speak differently. They have a certain accent. And when I speak in English, they say I carry that accent still. And people will laugh at me and judge me on all these because still I was struggling with a one sentence or two sentences in my prayer. I remember that morning, Saturday morning, I'm debating, am I really going to join the English team or Korean team? My heart is debating like this. In the morning, around 10 a.m., I vividly remember that morning. But do you know why I was debating my heart going to the left and to the right? It was because of fear of man, what other people would think of me, what other English-speaking people would think of me. With this kind of minimal skill, how can you join this English team? How dare you? All those condemnation and criticism well, in my head, the fear of man occupied me, and that's why I was pondering. But by the grace of God, my heart went to this direction. If I perish, I perish. <laughs> no, not to that degree. Joined the team. First day, we went out and met the perspective, and we talked, and, you know, we need to converse, casually converse and things like that. And I said that one probably sentence or two on the way, Back to church in the car, my trainer was a lady, and another trainee was a sister also. This sister, second generation, perfect English-speaking, beautiful sister. You know what she says in the car on the way to the church? She goes, why are you here? There are so many Korean-speaking teams. You can join there so you can fool me. Share the gospel in your own language. And I said to in my heart, I said, there's a Korean word that I cannot directly translate. So, um, but anyways, <laughs> please do not provoke me. <laughs> but I overcame. I did not give up. About fourth or fifth week, I'm bounded, right? And I'm ab not able to share the gospel that I am learning, trying to memorize. It was so difficult, so difficult. I remember, I memorized one sentence, then I forget again next day. But on fourth or fifth week, there's a trainer kicked me out. You share the gospel. We don't care what's going to happen. You, you just do it. I thank her. And that day, something miracle happened. Breakthrough came about. I'm speaking, I'm sharing the gospel to these people whom I met for the first time. English speakers, three of them. And my tongue is not mine. The Holy Spirit grabbed me. My accent is not my accent. Pronunciation, grammar, 
totally different. The vocabulary I will never think in normal days will come to my mind, and I will fully share the gospel for 40 minutes. And at the end of sharing, I invited them to pray after me, and they all accepted Christ as a sinner. Praise the Lord. Praise God. If I did not make the decision on that Saturday morning because I feel the man, then I won't be here with you today. I won't be here with you today. Fear of man can such captivate us and bind us that we cannot move forward in faith. I want to read you certain segment. There was a lady in Australia. She wanted to pursue her dream. So she decided to go to England to find a better jobs and so forth. But however, she was not able to find good jobs that she expected. But instead, she ended up working for, this is a new vocabulary that I need to learn, Palliative care unit, you know what that is? P-A-L-L-I-A-T-I-V-E care. Oh, I'm, I don't feel too bad. <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. This is a care unit in the hospital where people age and they're dying. And they, the, the nurses and doctors try to soothe their pain. And that's called a palliative care unit. You need to learn your English. <laughs> Anyways, she worked there. She was a really polite girl and kind and gentle. So these elderly men and women uh, began to like her. So they began to share their life stories. But these people about to die share their life stories and regrets. And then and she returned back to Australia, and she still worked for that kind of care unit. And then she found common regrets of all these people, so many people throughout their lives. And five of them, he, she pushed, put, it, put them on her blog. In one year, three million visitation. So he, she eventually wrote the book called The Top Five Regrets of Dying. Let me share with you what these five are. First, see, we need a volunteer from media team. First one, I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. The very first regret all the people shared was this one. I wish I had a courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. In other words, I wish I lived a life that I'd be courageous enough to pursue my own dream, not caring about opinions or criticism of others, not fearing people that I may have pursued and true to myself. That was the first regret of all the people she met. Second one, I wish I don't work so hard so that people regret they didn't spend much time with their family, their children. Uh, honey, I will work on this. Third, I wish I had a courage to express my feelings. We repress our feelings. We cannot be honest with other people. Because why? We are fearful of what they will think of me if I become honest with my feelings. Fear of man. That was the third regret out of five top regrets of the people. Fourth one, I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. Okay. Let's look at fifth one. I wish that I had let myself be happier. I wish that I had let myself 
he have here. But along the way, if you read the content of it, basically what it means is because he or she was frightened by other people, what they would think of her, the choices that she or he made were not according to what he wished but according to what others will say or expect of me. Because of fear of men, out of five top regrets, three of them came because of fear of men. That much, that much are frightened from the fear of people. Yes, Korean people, naturally, we have a shame culture, but it's not only for Korean. This lady is Australian. She went to England and these are predominantly from Caucasian people. All of us, whether we are grown in the same culture or live in America, it doesn't matter. All of us struggle with the fear of people. But that's not the will of God. As God beat me to come back to GMI a few months ago, I was stricken with the fear of man. You don't know how popular I am at KM. <laughs> 3,000 people know me and like me. No, of course, not 3,000, 2,999. They think I am excellent preacher. <laughs> Why do you laugh? 3,000 of them, they knew why I, why I went out by faith. Living, it was led of Holy Spirit. Now, year after, I'm returning back to shame, cultural oriented, Korean, babish people. Go back there? No way, no way. That's what I said at first. But by His grace, I overcame that. At first, you know what I decided to do? I would put baseball cap on my face and, and come to church for about six months until people talk about me but I will overcame because it doesn't matter. They are not my saviors. They are not my helpers. Only God is my rescuer. God is my redeemer. God is my savior. God is the true one who can really help us. We are to love the people. We are to serve the people, but do not be afraid of the people. Amen? Let us be liberated. Let us be liberated. Let us come out of comfort zone. Let us embark and let us go forward. You know, when I say our ministry will become multi-ethnic, you, you think it's easy for me to say that? No. It takes courage. It's a risk-taking because I might be fear of you thinking, who is he? His English is not perfect. He just recently came and he's trying to hope for this ministry to grow and become multi-ethnic. You know, you don't think that I think about that? No. Yes, I do. But I say it anyways. And I say we will grow to thousands. And you will say, <laughs> yeah, he's not afraid of what you think when he claps his hands. Let's give all the glory to God. <laughs> we'll say, what if, if I make a mistake? What if it doesn't work? So what? Look at Peter. He walked out. He began to sink. So what? At least only Peter walked a few steps on the water. No other was able to. Jesus caught him. If we make a mistake, Jesus will be there to catch us and raise us up again. And then we know we reveal his grace, his love, enduring love. Yes, we are fragile. We make a mistake, but God will always will kick in to save us, to rescue us, uplift us. But at least we can say, I did it out of faith. That I was not coward, not able to come out of my comfort zone, or fearful of man that I couldn't make a decision. For the rest of my life, I was indecisive. That will not be my confession. That will not be our confession. Amen? Amen? Faith is risk-taking. Faith requires us to come out of comfort zone. Faith requires us to overcome fear of people. We fear God. We love God. We follow after God. He is the ultimate Savior. Praise God. Let's pray.
Can, can I ask all of you to stand up? Let's pray. Increase our faith, Lord. What is your fear? What do you fear? What is the fear? How much are you comforted in your situation? We are not going anywhere. We cannot step out, fearing that I might die or I might get drowned. No, Jesus right beside us. Where he calls us, that's the safest place that we want to go. So let's ask you, God, Lord, bless us. Lord, increase our faith. Increase my faith, Father. Let me not be enslaved by circumstances. Let me not be enslaved by fear of man. I fear you. I only adore you. You are true living God. So let's call out and ask God to bless and increase our faith. One, two, three. Jesus! Jesus! Jesus!